Hello everyone. So this lecture will discuss Sylvia Plath's poem, The Colossus. So just to give you a context, uh, the poem is included in your course literature of the 20th century. And to be a bit more specific, module three of the course. Uh, which covers the time period from 1946 to 1966. Now, uh, talking about the poem in the context of your syllabus, uh, there are certain things uh, as far as module 3 of this course, Literature of the 20th Century course is concerned. There are certain things that you are expected to know. Like if you are familiar with the syllabus, they give a subtitle called Background. And in this particular module, the 20 years from 1946 to 1966, basically the post-war period, like the time, the 20 years right after the end of the Second World War, there are certain uh, things that you are expected to know in the context of li the literature of the 20th century in this time period, that is rise of new literatures, movement poetry, uh, the absurd confessional poetry and the transition to postmodernism and Sylvia Plath's poems or her poetry is directly correlated with the term confessional poetry. Okay, So occasionally I will be using the term confessional poetry uh, to refer to Sylvia Plath's poem and you have to contextualize it uh, in that regard like connected to your syllabus. So having said that, let's move on to the uh, author, sorry, uh, the poet and her poem. So here I've uh, given you a brief overview about the poet Sylvia Plath. She was born uh, on October 27th, 1932 and died uh, when she was 30 years old on February 11, 1963. Now, uh, even those of you who haven't read her poems would know about how Sylvia Plath died. She committed suicide at the age of 30 by sticking her head into an oven and basically suffocated herself to death. So, even people who are not students of literature or teachers of literature for that matter would be familiar with Platt's name because of her obsession with death and her various suicide attempts but I'd like to take this um, moment to remind my students that Plath is not just about her suicide attempts or her eventual, eventually successful suicide attempt She's a very strong feminist voice in the post-war period of American as well as British literature. So taking a look at the poet, uh, she's essentially referred to as an American poet. And she also dabbled in writing novels. Her most popular novel, as in her most, uh, uh, her published novel is titled The Bell Jar, which is uh, semi-autobiographical. So here I've uh, given you a brief overview, like year-wise over overview of her life, her very short life. Um, she first published her poem. Her first poem was published at the age of eight. Now this particular period, the age of eight, is very important due to another reason as well because Plath lost her father Otto Plath O-T-T-O Otto it's a German name he's Otto Plath is German so she lost her father a few days after her eighth birthday and this is also the time when she published her first poem and She's a very intelligent woman. Like uh, there are reports which say that Sylvia Plath had an IQ of around 160, which is like super high. So very intelligent girl. 
and she entered the Smith College on a scholarship in 1951 and in 1952 she won a fiction contest um, conducted by the Metamoisel magazine. So the Metamoisel magazine is important in another regard because she, while she was at Smith College she did a brief internship there and um, there was a mental breakdown during that period and she was admitted in a mental asylum. So all these experiences, her experiences as a college student, her experience as an intern at the Metamoisel magazine, all these things come together in her semi-autobiographical novel, The Bell Jar. And in 1955, she graduated from Smith with the highest honor, summa cum laude, that's the Latin word. Uh, for the topper like in our language we say topper but uh, the word the term used in American colleges is summa cum laude it's Latin. In 1956 she married Ted Hughes they had two children uh, Frida and Nicholas I think Frida was uh, two years old and Nicholas was just nine months old when Plath committed suicide like there is this description that apparently before uh, sticking her head into the oven, suffocating herself, like basically these are not like the microwaves, these ovens that I'm talking about, these are not like the microwaves that we had, we have now. It's a different kind of a primitive oven. And when you switch on the oven, there is uh, carbon monoxide gases released. So in order to protect her children from that while she was killing herself, Plath basically covered all the, you know, sealed the rooms with towels. Like the kids were sleeping in the next room. So she closed the door and she sealed the, you know, door. Uh, like there will be a gap between the door and the floor right so she sealed all those gaps with towels and made sure that her kids were safe so yeah and the thing is her son Nicholas um, he also committed suicide like later in life like his mother because of depression now um, Plath had a very tumultuous life especially after she met Ted Dukes she had a very tumultuous life. Their love story is very notorious and popular. But she's above all of that, she's a very intelligent woman who wrote powerful poetry with brilliant imagery. Okay, so coming to that part of her life, her profession as a writer, her first uh, collection of poems appeared in 1960. Um, the collection was titled The Colossus and Other Poems and we study one poem from that collection. The, you know, the titular poem from that collection. And then posthumously in 1965, another collection of her works uh, was published titled Ariel. Uh, between the two, The Colossus and Other Poems and Ariel, Ariel was considered to be the more mature work because you see a very uh, serious plath who is being original. Like earlier critics said that like before the publication of Ariel, one of the um, most intense criticism against plath was that her work was derivative. Derivative in the sense she copied uh, sometimes the style and sometimes the content by other writers there was a certain sense of imitation like her work was not truly entirely hers but um, once Ariel was published posthumously after her death um, a lot of critics said that okay now this is original plath this is the plath that um, we were waiting for that kind of a thing and in 1962 the couple Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath separated because uh, Hughes was having an affair with their tenant. So they had uh, rented their house to a couple and uh, Hughes was having an affair with 
the woman Asiya, I think her name was Asiya something. So a German woman, um, German or Austrian, I can't remember now. So uh, they were having an affair and when Plath found out, couple of months later they separated and she was living with her kids uh, alone when she committed suicide so this is like a brief overview of uh, Platt's life now I've mentioned two poems in this slide uh, daddy and lady Lazarus these are her popular poems there are other poems like tulips uh, and my personal favorite is mad girl's love song any a woman, young woman who's ever fallen in love, who's ever had a crush on somebody would very intensely correlate with what Plath talks about in her poem Mad Girl's Love Song. So you can check that out as well. There is Daddy, uh, which is kind of like a commentary on her relationship with her father. Same as Colossus. So the poems Colossus and daddy can be read side by side like you know we can juxtapose the two poems lady lazarus is about her uh, survival after her suicide her first suicide attempt and tulips is about her stay in a hospital mad girl's love song is about her lover so these are the various other poems that you can check out that sylvia plath has written She's critically acclaimed for these poems. So in the earlier slide, we uh, saw that Plath uh, separated from her husband Ted Hughes in 1962. So there was this one year period after the separation and before her suicide. Uh, this particular period is very important because this is the time when she wrote uh, with great fervor like and these poems were later published as a collection uh, titled Ariel. So the um, biographers and critics usually refer to this period as her mature phase, her mature year, especially the last three years, specifically the last year but uh, collectively the last three years of her life she wrote poems at great speed abandoning the restraints and conventions of her earlier work uh, these were poems of stark self-revelation and confession so um, one of uh, Platt's strong point was that she could derive creative energy from uh, episodes uh, from daily life especially episodes from the daily life of a woman and there was this very intensely private connection that she had with her poems like you know she take a very personal experience and she turned into this amazing poem but the thing is ever since she started writing poems this was her style but she was not very confident about uh, discussing her personal experiences or personal life like that like you know in public for public scrutiny but the last three years she kind of you know got rid of such restraints or such inhibitions she had and her poems uh, reflect uh, self-revelation and confession so the word confession is appearing for the second time here confession is when you talk about an intensely personal experience confessional poetry is when you talk about an intensely personal experience and turned into something universal to something that everyone can relate to and her poems like daddy and the one that we are going to study the colossus explore her conflicted relationship with her father there are very um, a large number of uh, critics and uh, analysts believe that uh, Platt's relationship with her father uh, is like a classic illustration of the Electra complex like you can check out what the Electra complex is online 
um, because I don't want to digress into that now. So uh, I have included here some of the, um, you know, critical appraisals of her work. These are things that you can include when you're writing a critical analysis of Platt's poetry, like uh, this review that appeared in the New York Times. Her poems showcase a relentless honesty, uh, like a certain kind of truth that you cannot shake off. And there is a sophistication in the use of rhyme and there is a bitter force. And another review in the poetry magazine says there is a pervasive impatience, a positive urgency to the poems. Uh, she was also awarded uh, the Pulitzer Award for Poetry in 1982, again posthumously. And here on the other side of the slide, on the right side of the slide, I have uh, given a brief extract from something that her friend, uh, her poet friend Alvarez has wrote about Platt's poetry. Let's just take a quick read of that. Platt's case is complicated by the fact that in her mature work, she deliberately used the details of her everyday life as raw material for her art, uh, like a casual visitor or an unexpected telephone call, a cut. Vegetables are in a dealer, where on the Murina and a crutch. She writes intensely forceful poetry about that. A bruise, like Kalu Nidichu. Like you snub your toe, you snub your toe against a table. She wrote poetry about that. A kitchen bowl, a candlestick, everything became usable, charged with meaning, transformed. Her poems are full of references and images that seem impenetrable at this distance, but which could mostly be explained in footnotes by a scholar with full access to the details of her life. Like this is true for most of her poetry. Like if you read the poem, The Colossus for the first time, you get this very weird idea that there is this woman who wants to sleep inside a statue while she's trying to repair the statue. So you're like, okay, fine. So there is this woman who's trying to repair a statue. But if you have access to biography, um, if you have access to Sylvia Platt's biography, the poem makes more sense. So this is true for most of her poems. Like there are these random references and images which seem impenetrable. Like, you know, you feel like it's too dense. You cannot understand it. But with footnotes by a scholar who has access to the details of her life, if there are like I am doing for you right now. Like you, if you read the poem without the right kind of information about Platt's life, like how you should correlate the poem, The Colossus with uh, Platt's father. Like if you don't have that kind of an information, the poem feels impenetrable. Like you can't make sense of what this poet is trying to say. And Another critic uses the term, the domestic surreal for what Platt's poetry does. Like it takes uh, its raw material from daily domestic life and twists it into something else, something which becomes unrecognizable, but at the same time fascinating. So in order to refer to that phenomenon, in Platt's poetry, another critic uses the term the domestic surreal. So this is again uh, more critical material that you can use while you're writing a critical analysis of uh, Platt's poetry. Like in the New York Times book review, Joyce Carol Oates described Platt as one of the most celebrated and controversial of post-war poets writing in English. And on the World Socialist website, Margaret Rees observed, whether Plath wrote about nature, 
or about the social restrictions on individuals she stripped away the polite veneer so there was no polite business like you know can you please give me some freedom can you please can you please there was no such politeness about plats writing whether she was writing about nature or whether she was talking about the kind of inhibitions that society placed on individuals she let her writing express elemental forces forces of nature and primeval fears and in doing so she laid bare the contradictions that tore apart appearance and hinted at some of the tensions hovering just beneath the surface of the american way of life in the post war so coming to the poem itself here i've uh, given only the first two stanzas of the poem there are four other stanzas so let's read the entire poem first you have to get a copy of the entire poem while i'm reading so <clears throat> here it goes the colossus by sylvia plath i shall never get you put together entirely pieced glued and properly jointed mule bray pig grunt and body cackles proceed from your great lips it's worse than a barnyard perhaps you consider yourself an oracle mouthpiece of the dead or of some god or other 30 years now i've labored to dredge the silt from your throat i am none the wiser scaling little ladders with glue pots and pails of lysol i crawl like an ant in mourning over the weedy acres of your brow to mend the immense skull plates and clear the bald white tumuli of your eyes a blue sky out of the orisitia arches above us o oh, father all by yourself your pithy and historical as the roman forum i open my lunch on a hill of black cypress your fluted bones and acanthine hair are littered in their old anarchy to the horizon line it would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin nights i squat in the cornucopia of your left ear out of the wind counting the red stars and those of plum color the sun rises under the pillar of your tongue my hours are married to shadow my hours are married to shadow no longer do i listen for the scrape of a key on the blank stones of the landing so this is the entire poem now before we Uh, go on to a line by line analysis of the poem i want to bring your attention to the image that i have given here this particular image is the colossus of rhodes r h o d e s colossus of rhodes which is generally referred to as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world like we know about the seven wonders of the modern world the colossus of rhodes is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world now this is the reference in plats poem that we are going to study now the colossus of rhodes is actually <coughs> a statue of the greek sun god helios and it was erected in the city of rhodes and if you look at it uh, helios is standing guard at the entry point to the city so this statue was erected in the city of rhodes um, on the greek island by the same name so this is an island city rhodes is an island city and this is a statue of the greek sun god helios and if you look at the statue closely he resembles the statue of liberty a little bit and in fact it was this heli uh, this statue was considered to be the tallest in the ancient world okay so the thing is when the city of rhodes 
was attacked uh, the statue was also uh, destroyed and there have been many plans to you know reconstruct the statue but it has never materialized so we have only artistic depictions of the statue the colossus of rhodes so <clears throat> this is the reference this is the colossus that uh, plath refers to in her poem now the colossus in her life so you look at this this is like the tallest statue in the ancient world a very mighty figure who is standing guard at the entry point of a city so the colossus in plath's life is her father and to be a little more specific her dead father so how does somebody who's long long gone from her life like her father died when she was 8 years old so how does somebody who was who died who passed away a long time ago become a figure like colossus so that is the correlation we have to understand that is the connection that we have to understand when we read the poem okay so let's take a look at the first two stanzas i shall never get you put together entirely if you remember the statue of colossus the colossus of rhodes was destroyed right uh, when the city uh, was under siege so now the statue is broken and plath is saying i shall never put you together entirely pieced glued and properly jointed mule bray pig grunt and body cackles proceed from your great lips i am trying to put you together and i am trying to make you talk but all that proceeds from your lips your great lips are nonsensical sounds like a mule bray a mule is a donkey something that belongs in that family Uh, a pig grunting and body cackles like a body cackle is when you crack a dirty joke and you know the people sitting around you uh, cackle like they they laugh in a very you know vulgar manner so that is a body cackle so all that proceeds i'm trying to make you talk i'm trying to uh, put you together and make you talk but all that proceeds from your great lips are nonsensical sounds it's worse than a barnyard like the sounds that come from your lips it's like very noisy it's worse than the sounds from a barnyard a farm perhaps you consider yourself an oracle mouthpiece of the dead or of some god or other so the thing with plathus she is comparing basically comparing her father to the colossus of rhodes and the colossus of rhodes according to greek myth was supposed to be an oracle a mouthpiece of the dead he spoke from beyond the grave so you, perhaps you consider yourself an oracle 30 years now i have labored to dredge the silt from your throat i am none the wiser i have tried to la- i have labored i have struggled to dredge the silt from your throat uh, you know the dirt that clogs up your throat i have tried to dredge it out i have tried to clean it out but i for 30 years i have struggled to do that like to make sense of what you are saying to figure out the words supposedly words of wisdom that is supposed to come from your lips but i am none the wiser i still haven't been able to do it uh, so before i uh, move on to the next two stanzas of the poem i would like to draw your attention to the photo of a gentleman on your left and this is silvia plath's father otto plath okay so this is the person that plath is uh, referring to in the poem so going back to 
the pole. Scaling little ladders with glue pots and pails of Lysol, I crawl like an ant in mourning over the weedy acres of your brow to mend the immense skull plates and clear the bald, the white tumuli of your eyes. A blue sky out of the Ores Citia arches above us, or father, all by yourself, your pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. I open my lunch on a hill of black cypress. Your fluted bones and acanthine hair are littered. <clears throat> okay, so that continues into the next answer. So just imagine this uh, picture. Okay, so there is this young woman inside a statue a giant statue and the statue is broken and she's trying to mend repair the statue so she's using little ladders and since she's trying to put the statue together uh, she has glue pots and uh, pails of lysol lysol is uh, disinfectant right and you uh, scale little ladders and you crawl like an ant in mourning over the weedy acres of your brow. So she's on the statue. Sometimes she's inside, sometimes she's on the statue. She's trying to mend the immense skull plates and clear the bald white tumuli of your eyes. The tumuli is actually tumulus. Okay, uh, tumuli is the plural of uh, tumulus, and a tumulus is a mound, a mound of earth. When you know you bury someone, our grave mark you pile a mound of earth. So that's called a tumulus. Okay. So here the tumuli of your eye, like you know, concave. The eye is the eye of the statue is uh, conve concave, not convex. So it looks like a mound, a white mound. A blue sky out of the Orisitia arches above us. Orisitia is a reference to uh, Greek tragedies like uh, Aeschylus, who is a renowned uh, playwright from ancient Greece, wrote these uh, uh, three dramas, Greek tragedies, uh, around uh, you know the Greek mythology like Agamemnon's murder and all of that. And the trilogy of dramas is referred to as Orisitia. Okay, so a blue sky out of the Orisitia, ancient Greece, le, uh, Orisitia, le, uh, blue sky, ancient Greece, le, pole, the blue sky, a blue sky out of the Orisitia arches above us. O oh, Father, all by yourself, your pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. A Roman Forum. Uh, is a um, reference to a public meeting in ancient Rome like important decisions were taken in public meetings the uh, town elders or the rulers will the councilmen will meet in a uh, very you know in, uh, nice place and they would take important decisions there and that is referred to as the Roman Forum. Your pithy and historical is the Roman Forum. I open my lunch on a hill of black cypress. A black uh, cypress is a tree. Okay. Your fluted bones and acanthine hair are littered. So the statue is all broken and she's sitting amidst the. Sometimes she's crawling inside the statue. Sometimes she's sitting. Uh, amidst the ruins of the statue, your fluted bones and your acanthine hair. Like if you, I want to draw your attention back to the picture. If you look at this image of Autoplath, you can see that his hair is slightly spiky, right? So uh, such hair can be referred to as acanthine hair. So your acanthus plant in the pole, that is the leaf in the pole, the mudi, Reference, your fluted bones and acanthine hair are littered. Now, see, if you remember the introduction, like um, to the poet and the poem, you'll know that uh, 
Plath uses very twisted imagery. So it's not like reading a romantic poem where the images are consistent, like well connected. There is this certain, you know, uh, sense of being scattered, like other post-war condition. Like Namla, when we began the lecture, I told you how there are certain things you are expected to know in this module of your course. Adil onnu na varena transition to postmodern is on. Apoi postmodern condition de oru highlight, alengil oru distinctive feature anu varena da. E oru lack of coherence on. Like there is a, there is a sense of being scattered. Like that is a reflection of the post-war condition. Like the war basically destabilized the human psyche. So, that is a reflection of the Kana. Okay. So, moving on to the last two stances. Uh, littered in their old anarchy to the horizon line. It would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. Nights, I squat in the corn copia of your left ear out of the wind. Counting the red stars and those of plum color. The sun rises under the pillar of your tongue. My hours are married to shadow. No longer do I listen for the scrape of a keel on the blank stones of the landing. So here she is saying it would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. Like there is this very towering statue, right? You have to remember the uh, image of the statue. This is huge statue guarding the entrance to the um, city of Rhodes. So, one, uh, so I think I uh, told you that the statue was uh, constructed um, um, in memory of a victory, uh, of a conquest and it was ruined during an earthquake. That is what the story tells us or that is what documents tell us. So it would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. One lightning stroke is not going to bring down this towering figure. It would take more than that to uh, create such a ruin. And nights, I squat in the uh, cornucopia Uh, of your left ear out of the wind. Now the word cornucopia it is uh, an ornamental container in the area. Horn or uh, horned goat's goat's horn. Namde mutanad in the comb in the shape pillar. Or ornamental container neana e cornucopia and the cornucopia is always in Greek myth, the cornucopia is a symbol of abundance. Like, dharalatthinde, uh, alengil, prosperity de uru symbol an, okay. So, here, <clears throat> I squat in the cornucopia of your left ear, like, it's referring to the structure inside the ear. Uru statue in the agatha structure na kurchana, parayna. I squat in the cornucopia of your left ear, out of the wind. And I stay in, at nights, I stay inside the statue, inside your ear, out of the wind. Counting the red stars and those of plum color, mm -hmm. the sun rises under the pillar of your tongue. So, through inside the statue, at night I can count the stars and I can see the sun rising. My hours are married to shadow. No longer do I listen for the scrape of a keel on the blank stones of the landing. So again, going back to the image, if you remember, uh, there is this entry point to the city. See, Kadalinda uh, Adithana entry point, Avdiani statue. So imagine if a ship has to enter into the city of Rhodes, it has to go through the statue. I can give you a similar example from Bahubali. Like if you remember the scene, Bahubali 2, if you remember the scene where Devasena is first taken to Mahishmadi, you remember the scene where the, uh, you know, the 
pillar on the ship scrapes against the statue that guards Mahishmadi, something like that. So uh, here what she's saying is, no longer do I listen for the scrape of a keel on the blank stones of the landing. I don't concern myself with what is happening outside. I'm all curled up inside the statue. My hours are married to shadow. I remain in the shadow of the statue. Now, what does all this mean? I've just uh, explained the meaning of the lines. So, what is the subtext? That is the important part. Okay. So, <clears throat> the subtext is that uh, Sylvia Plath is grappling <clears throat> with the memory of her father. She's She has a she remembers that she has a conflicted relationship. She had a conflicted relationship with her father and she is still fighting with the memory of her father. So, our conflict in a kurchana, like it's like a love-hate relationship. She loves her father but at the same time she hates her father because she cannot get out of this conflict, the conflict that she feels when she thinks about her father. That is the subtext of the poem and I will give you some more details. The closing slide, the end, the slide uh, at the end of this lecture will give you some critical points from which you can discuss this angle of the poem. So here, I have uh, listed out some of the points that you can dwell on while trying to understand the poem. And the first one is the ancient Greek idea of the Colossus. So here I am not referring to the statue, the Colossus of Rhodes. That Colossus is with, written with a capital C. Uh, here it is an idea, the idea of the Colossus. So the idea of the Colossus is that uh, it is uh, a paradox, okay, uh, which uh, may, which is which evokes the individual's presence as well as his absence. Other korchudi simple So let's say uh, somebody in our family has passed away, like a grandparent or somebody uh, like that we respect and adore. Okay, apo namla orda photo. Frame the entrance absent you are asserting his or her presence. So it's like a paradox. Where is the name? Presence and absence. Like that's the same with the Colossus of Rhodes also. <coughs> presence and absence. E, uh, you just think about the example that I gave you. Now, this is Colossus in the Parayana Greek idea. The concept of the Colossus. Evoking a, a person's presence as well as his absence. If you look at Plath's case, her father has died. Okay. And because he is dead, he is absent. And because he is absent, she keeps dwelling on him, obsessing over him with more intensity. So, he is present in her psyche. So, presence and absence. It is a paradox. You are mourning the absence of the person. You are grieving the absence of the person but at the same time you are uh, basically celebrating his life by thinking about him again and again right so idana idea so the absence of her father looms large in her psyche and by comparing him to the colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world he, she is attributing a lot of power to the father figure, to the memory of the father figure. And her frustration comes from the fact, like the first uh, three stanzas of the poem, um, she's trying to make him speak, make this 
absent presence speak but all that proceeds from his lips are nonsensical noises it's like a barnyard she cannot make sense out of his uh, sense out of it so she is frustrated so there is this powerful memory of a person that is no longer there she is trying to make sense of this powerful presence she is trying to understand the relevance of this memory but she cannot do that so her challenge and her frustration is to come to terms with his monumentality like this looming presence in her life she has to come to terms with the fact that she might never be able to uh, you know <clears throat> uh, tone down the importance of her uh, dead father like he is going to be a monumental figure in her psyche at least but at the same time this monumental figure there is a limitation to what a dead person can do for your life right like yes of course you can keep hanging on to his memory but at a certain stage in your after a certain stage in your life you're just clinging on to something that is absent right so come to terms with his monumentality while accepting his limitations and the uh, and silvia plath at the end of the poem she says she is curled up inside the cornucopia of his left ear right so she is basically given up her life her individual life and her autonomy uh, you know uh, her capacity to take decisions on her own rather than be influenced by the memory of her dead father she's given all that up and she's constantly trying to make the statue speak but she seems resigned to that fact it's like she's uh, come to terms with that sacrifice sacrificing her individual life because she's obsessing over the memory of her dead father now personally speaking i am not a huge fan of this attitude like what she is doing is actually unhealthy mentally psychologically speaking what she is doing is ignoring everything real around her ignoring her present she is focusing on a past which will never become real she is focusing on a memory she is over dwelling on a memory she is trying to make a memory speak and define her life within the framework of that memory while losing focus of what is happening in her present life so personally speaking i'll never recommend that kind of an attitude like it's like obsessing over a relationship that is over you broke up it's over you cannot okay maybe you can spend a couple of months obsessing over the breakup like you know listen to sad songs and talk to your friends you know drive your friends crazy by constantly talking about that person but after that you move on you don't spend your entire life in those memories do you get my point so in the poem silvia platz is resigned to the fact that she is sacrificing her own life in the memory of that absent father figure she is curled up inside the statue she is seeing the sun rise and the stars at night inside this she is spending her days and her nights inside the statue but personally i would say that is not a healthy attitude so there is this again there is this love hate relationship uh most scholars or most critics agree that she seems resigned to be living in the shadow of a father figure who is no longer there but there are also critics who say that the tone of the poem shows a certain frustration because she cannot get rid of this memory this monumental memory of her father so there is you can interpret it both ways depending on how you read it depending on your perspective you can either say she's resigned to the fact that she's going to spend her entire life in the shadow of this memory 
or you can interpret that she is frustrated about having to spend her entire life under this shadow okay depending on how you read the poem personally speaking i think she's resigned i don't see a, a sense of conflict i think that she's more than willing to spend her life under this shadow she's like she's comfortable there is this sense of comfort that she uh, feels about spending her life like that but of course uh, how you read the poem may not be the same as I, how i read now another angle to understanding the poem is from a feminist perspective there are critics feminist critics who say that uh, the the statue the colossus of rhodes is a reference to patriarchal culture and how her creative energy uh, is frustrated about having to spend it under the shadow of patriarchy so she cannot make it speak like her muse is not speaking because she is spending it under the shadow of patriarchy there is also another line of interpretation like that but uh, i think uh, mostly it is a reference to her father her father might also be symbolic of how uh, poetry and creative writing especially in the time period that we are talking about was largely male dominated there was a lot of you know uh male dominance happening in the uh you know creative writing scene so her feminine perspective her feminine energy is unable to speak like the god of poetry so to speak if you imagine the colossus of rhodes for one second as a god of poetry or as a muse the male muse is not making sense to her she cannot understand what the male muse is uh, say like she cannot make sense and finally she is either resigned to the fact that okay this is how it's going to be we live in a patriarchal culture so my creative energy my feminine perspective is always going to be overshadowed by this male god of writing or whatever depending on how you see it you can use the right word male god of poetry or male muse or male god of writing whatever you want to uh, say so she is conflicted i hope you understand i hope you understood the poem and i hope you understood what i was trying to convey to you but of course after listening to the lecture if you have any doubts or clarifications uh, feel free to message me in the group or message me personally we can always um i can always clarify uh, it for you thank you for listening have a good day